Right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's really awesome to have you all here with me. I'm just going to close this a little bit so there's better light here. Um, I hope you are well on this beautiful Saturday morning, um, wherever you are, people from all over the world. It's wonderful to have you with us. And we're going to be talking about sleep today. It is the hot topic. Um, we all know about sleep deprivation, and we're going to be sorting that out today. So um, I'm going to end the poll. I know many of you haven't filled it out, but I'm going to end it anyway, and I'm going to share the results just so you know who's here. Majority of you are, have babies who are not to three months old. And in fact, 50% of babies who bought from birth to six months old. So that's, so that's by far the majority of you. Two to three wakings at night. Oh, that's torture. 82% um, of you have heard about the ParentSense app. We are going to have a survey at the end, if you wouldn't mind filling those out as well, because I'd love to know about how you feel about the app. Um, about a quarter of you have the subscription, and some of you have the free trial, um, and some of you haven't used it yet. So um, please do go on and have a look at it. All right. Okay, so let me um, stop sharing so that I can put my um, share properly. So I'm now going to share my screen and let's get started and start talking about some sleep issues. Right, so sleep's the hot topic. Um, and tonight we, today we're really going to look at how we can help your babies to sleep through. So a little bit about the format for today. I'm going to try and speak for no more than half an hour. Um, and then I'm going to hopefully leave half an hour for questions. We have had a massive uptake. More than 500 of you have signed up for this um, webinar this morning. So I will not get to all the questions. And I'm really sorry about that. But I will get to as many as I can. And um, you can answer them down below in the Q&A. And that's probably the best way to do it. Um, I will try and monitor the chat as well. But um, the Q&A will be where I'll go for the questions. So do ask them there. Right, just a quick a little bit about the app, um, just as a little bit of a precursor. Um, I'm sure that you know that you've got um, on the home screen, you've got your um, widgets that show you your baby's day, their sleep, their feeding, their health and their play. I know that your circles look a bit different to that, but there's gonna be some changes coming. Click on this bottom heart and you get the routine, suggested routine, it is flexible. You do not follow it to the letter, you make it according to your baby's day. We've got the play, art, play um, activities, the health screen, the sleep screen, and then the feeding screen as well. Um, and then of course, you're able to track your baby and we are bringing other and um, more interesting tracking up as well fairly soon. In the next couple of months, we'll be looking at poos and all sorts of health issues, even teething. Here's our teething chart, which will be going in. And um, we also have our daily activities, as you know, your milestones. So don't forget to check off your milestones for your baby and then your recipes. Okay, so if you're not using the app, do go on and use it. And, I'm ask, and I'd love to ask you that if you are using the app and if you're loving it, please do review it on the um, App Store because it helps us get more um, yeah, users onto the app. All right, so the big question in all of your heads is when is my baby going to sleep through the night? So um, here's the answer to the question. Um, you will never sleep again. So, of course, that's a joke because you will sleep, um, but to um, let you know when your baby's likely to sleep through, um, the way that baby's um, kind of sleep trajectory works is in the first three months, um, it's very much we understand we're going to be feeding regularly, incrementally your baby should be starting to stretch their night um, sleeps um, and it stretches between feeds more and more, so that eventually they're only having maybe one or two night feeds by the time they hit about 14 weeks. And then from about 17 weeks, we get what's called the sleep regression, which is where they um, regress a little bit. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, it has to do with what's going on nutritionally, but it also has to do with um, the ability to self-soothe. So you can look at both of those as, um, as reasons why that happens. But if you manage it correctly by six months of age, um, as long as your baby's on full solids and all other things being equal, your baby should be able to sleep through the night. So certainly from six months of age, sleeping through is something you should aim for and something that you can expect. And when I talk about sleeping through, so let's just define it, we're talking about eight to 10 hours stretch between feeds. So that means going down at seven in the evening and waking at five in the morning would be a very typical um, sleep through period. And um, so that five in the morning, for those of you who aren't here because you wanna know how to not have your baby wake at five in the morning, I don't have a magic wand for that one. So, because that can be morning for babies. I know that's not what you wanted to hear. First piece of bad news. Okay. 
Why is it that more than 50% of toddlers are still not sleeping through? Well, the reason is that it is an incredibly complex and multifaceted issue. Um, we have um, health issues that can contribute to sleep issues, um, sensory issues. If a baby is very sensory sensitive or if they have having too little activity in the day, that can also re um, result in sleep issues. There are nutritional reasons why babies do not sleep through the night because they need extra food or certain food. There's the big self-soothing piece, which we'll talk about. I know many of you are wondering how to get my baby to self-soothe. And then, there, of course, in the toddler years, there's all the behavioral stuff as well. So it's multifaceted. It's complex. So whenever um, I do any work, and you'll know this very well if you followed any of my books or my app or any of the work I do, I always like starting with the basics because if you haven't ruled out the basics, you're going nowhere. So let's just quickly do deal with health issues. This little widget on your app over here that says health will actually be often leading you towards health things that help sleep. So please do always just follow that. If you click on it, it'll take you through into that part of the app and you can actually see um, what health advice is coming. So a couple of things to do with um, sleep and health. The first thing is you want to um, rule out worms um, and worm infestations typically happen in toddlers over the age of 18 months and so from 18 months onwards please deworm your toddlers. If your toddler is waking up in the middle of the night and spending kind of two hours being restless in the middle of the night this is one of the reasons why. So this is not for little babies but it is for toddlers. For little babies reflux can cause sleep issues so a little bit about reflux. Reflux is the regurgitation of milk solids that come up the esophagus, um, and it's very normal. In fact, I would say the great percentage of babies actually have that, but to varying degrees and with varying sensitivities. So normal reflux is just the regurgitation of milk curds up into the esophagus. M many babies will just swallow it back down. You won't even know that it had happened, neither, neither does your baby. Some babies it comes right out, and then we can get what, what we call our happy pukers, which are little ones that just oops all the time. Um, and there's kind of always this vomit coming out, but um, it doesn't bother them. It doesn't bother you other than the smell and they get on with it. But occasionally we get what's called gastroesophageal um, esophagitis. And um, basically that's when the milk curds come up, they're slightly acidic, they rest on the esophagus and they make a little burn or a little lesion on the, on the esophagus and it can be irritating. So the next time the reflux comes up, often when your baby's lying down, it burns the same area and then they become very niggly. So if your baby's waking very, very frequently at night and they're little, you might want to rule out reflux and you can chat to your doctor about that. And then the third big one is um, teething. Um, and teething is one that we actually do, um, I'll show you a little picture here. Teething is really only when a little tooth is pushing through. So, so let's just talk a little bit about teething and, and understand that. Um, um, at about nine, 10 weeks, your baby will find their hands and they'll get their hands to their mouth and start sucking on their hands a lot. And of course, when you're sucking on your hands, you make a whole lot of mucus so you've, of, of um, saliva. And so you've got lots of saliva, hands in mouth. And so immediately parents start to think, my baby must be teething. But the reality is, first of all, the teething is exceptionally rare under six months of age. So if your baby is um, has got their hands to their mouth under six months of age, um, it's probably 90% certain that they're just exploring their hands and that it's not actually got to do with teeth themselves. Um, by far the majority of um, little ones teeth after six months of age. And so you can um, watch for that after six months. And if your baby is teething, then you would need to address it because it can disrupt sleep because it's a little bit irritating around the gums and, they, and they, they, their gums can be a little bit sore. So how do you know if your baby's teething? Couple of things, they're over six months of age. They've got lots of saliva going on and often a little bit of eczema or dry patches around their chin or their, or their cheeks because of, of, all that dry, of all that saliva. They get this very interesting acid smelling poo. It's like quite a specific smell that your, that your little um, ones will get when they are teething. Um, it's acrid and it's acid and it's almost slightly sweet. Um, and when those poos smell like that, then you can probably bank on the fact that they are teething. But I do need to say that the hallmark feature of teething, of course, is actually a tooth coming through the gums. So um, feel those gums. If there's nothing going on there, um, then maybe your little one has other reasons for having the, the, the smelly poo. But majority of them, you'll get that cluster coming together. And then if they are teething, obviously you would want to give them a little bit of paracetamol um, at bedtime or in the middle of the night if they do wake. Because for a couple of days around the teething of that tooth, maybe seven days maximum, they could be a little bit more restless at night. Um, just to mention, going back one slide, um, one of the things that I haven't said here is um, allergies and eczema. We definitely know that little ones who've got eczema, 
and allergies are more wakeful at night, please get eczema under control. Um, I don't know, for those of you who haven't got my Allergy Sense book, it's a great book. Um, it actually got released in the UK yesterday. So any of you who in the UK, um, Weaning Sense and Allergy Sense were released there yesterday. And um, so you can now get it on Amazon. But that eczema um, is very interesting. Eczema is a break in the protective barrier of the skin. And we are now understanding that it's actually um, not so much that eczema follows on from allergies, but that eczema can actually lead to allergies. And the reason for that is that proteins and things that shouldn't be entering through the skin barrier can now enter through the skin barrier because of eczema and can actually result in the body mounting a little bit of an allergic reaction or a response to that, um, that, that allergen. And so um, we really, for many reasons, want to get eczema under control. So the way to do that is to put an emollient in your baby's bath. An emollient is like an oil. And when you pour it in the water, the water goes white. That's what an emollient is. And it's wonderfully moisturizing and traps the moisture in the body and actually helps to protect that protective layer of the skin. So if your little one does have eczema and is sleeping poorly, please address it with that. All right, moving on to our next basic. Um, and we all know these basics are very, very important. And the next basic is milk feeds. So let's talk about that. All right, so milk feeds, um, a couple of things about that. Um, first of all, please separate from as young as possible feeds and sleeps. So what do I mean by that? I know that your little ones are gonna feed just before they sleep. That's very a, a very good and natural way for you to um, kind of follow a routine where they do sleep, a feed, and then they do go to sleep. However, if they fall asleep on the breast or on the bottle, um, they are more likely to start to connect the breast or the bottle with falling asleep. In other words, need it in order to fall asleep. Now, for those of you who are pregnant or have got babies under 12 weeks of age, that is not as much of a concern because in the early days with your newborns, they are gonna fall asleep on the breast. It's just a given. There's all this beautiful um, oxytocin. Um, you will even feel this rush of tiredness as you're breastfeeding. Um, and th that's also this oxytocin coming through, making them drowsy. And, um, and then they do tend to fall asleep on the breast. But they don't form habits under 12 weeks of age. And the reason for that is that babies don't have long-term expectations at that age. So don't freak out too much at that age. But from about 12 weeks onwards, you're going to want to separate sleeps from, feeds from sleep. So feed and then pick your baby up, win them rouse them so that their eyes open and then put them down so that they're not specifically falling all the way to sleep on the breast. Um, and then again with night wakings as well, um, please don't wake your baby for milk feeds. It disrupts their sleep cycles. It isn't helpful in the long run. We often find babies end up with a habit. Like if you're doing this, what they call dream feeds at 10 p.m., when you decide to stop doing the dream feed at 10 p.m., they continue to do them. So don't do dream feeds. If your baby wakes at night, Treat a night feed very, very clinically. Um, you know, it's kind of um, go in, keep the light off, quick breastfeed, quick burp, change the nappy only if it's needed. Do not change nappies at night unless it's actually soiled with poo. Otherwise, most of these fabulous nappies now take all the moisture away so they don't cause nappy rash if you leave them on overnight. So very clinical, very quiet, and put your baby back down. Daytime feeds, lots of loves and cuddles and talks and chatters so that your little one knows that night feeds and day feeds are very different. So watch those night feeds and watch the feeding to sleep. The next tip with regards to nutrition is um, that your baby could at some point decide to need solid food and that will come according to age related needs. Um, uh, what we know about introduction of solids now, and you can read up about this and the science of it in weaning sense, but what we do know is that introducing solids anytime between the ages of um, 17 weeks and six months is absolutely fine in terms of your baby's health. You do not need to introduce solids at 17 weeks unless your baby's showing you the, the um, indications that they want solids at that time or they need them. Um, but try not to delay too much after six months either. So there's kind of this window. It's not a like it's not a line on the ground. There's a window in which you can start with solids. Solids will impact on um, sleep over time. It is not a magic wand. So a lot of us think that, you know, if we get our baby um, onto solids that night, they're gonna sleep through, okay? That does not happen. You all know that um, because it takes time. Your first day of solids is one teaspoon of carrot. I mean, it's a tiny little bit. Um, and then it starts to build up over time. And then eventually at six months, when you're on full, full solids with all that lovely iron and protein and all the essential fatty acids, then your baby is going in a good direction to be able to actually sleep through based on their nutritional needs. 
what we do do in the app is we take you through exactly um, when, when to introduce the wheat and the solids. So if you click across your little toggle that takes you into solids, you'll actually have the right quantity at the right time and at the right pace according to when you introduce. So if you introduce solids at 17 weeks, it's a very slow introduction into solids. If you introduce solids at 24 weeks, which is when your baby's close to six months, it'll be a much more rapid introduction of solids and we'll take you through that in the app. So um, I mentioned iron twice there, um, and so, uh, and essential fatty acids, sorry about that. Um, so just make sure your baby is having sufficient iron as well. Um, your, iron, your baby has iron stores from birth that deplete by about six months of age, and from six months onwards and into the toddler years, we need quite a bit of iron in our diet. And you can either get that through fortified cereals, or you can get it through um, green leafy vegetables and red meat. So uh, make sure that your baby is having those in their diet. All right, so we've moved on from the basics, and I'm sure that there'll be quite a few questions on the basics, which I will come to just now, but I'm going to move on now, and I'm going to talk about the awake times. So the awake times, which will always be up here on the top left-hand widget of your app, you will always know what your baby's correct awake time is, and they really are the key to a good day sleep routine. Um, so how does this work? I'm going to just take you through here how this works. So on this home page, you click on this little heart and you get the routine and then you actually put in what time your little one woke in the morning. So for instance, if they woke up at half past five in the morning, you would then pop, pop that in. Um, and what would happen is your whole routine will adjust according to that. So there's your wake time and it'll adjust according to that. Now, some of you might be a bit frustrated because you can't put in a time up here less than 5 a.m and later than 7 a.m. And the reason for that is that that's the time that you should be having your baby wake up because otherwise the whole day routine gets knocked on um, and disrupted a little bit. So that's the way that the awake time schedule works. And then you can watch, you can know that this particular baby who's 37 weeks old, she's woken up at five in the morning and her first sleep is gonna be at 8.15. And that is based of course on her awake times. So a little bit more about the awake times. Here's the graph um, for those of you who don't have the app um, these are the awake times. The awake time is the period of time from when your baby wakes up until they must be put back down again. So um, with the parent sense way, we don't, um, or in the baby sense way, we don't say every baby in the whole world goes to sleep at nine o'clock in the morning. Of course, that's not realistic. I know that there are routines that suggest that, but any of you who've tried to follow those, are very, you know, you'll know they're difficult. It's rather pertaining to your baby's age. So for instance, with your newborn, for those of you who are preggy or have got newborns, um, that awake time is very short. 45 minutes is literally long enough to do a breastfeed because 20 minutes one side, five minutes changing a nappy, 20 minutes the other side, that's 45 minutes and they're back down again. So for your newborn baby, there's really very short periods of time in which you're doing stimulation um, and engagement, but actually they're doing a lot of, a lot of sleeping and their sleep cycles can be for three hours or as short as 45 minutes, but usually for our young babies, they're sleeping for longer stretches. And then for your four to seven month old, as an example, here you've got a little one who's got kind of an hour and a half to two and a half hours awake time. And you'll know that in this kind of red space, you can actually start to get them to start to go, go down so that you can know that they are actually properly asleep by the time that two and a half hour period has passed. So for this four to seven month old, as an example, you're gonna have a longer period of awake time, more time for playing, feeding and everything else. And sometimes, and particularly once they're after seven months, you'll actually have two feeds happening in that period. Um, so don't worry if that happens, that you're actually ending up with two feeds in a period. And sometimes for the little babies, you'll have two sleeps in between um, your uh, feeds. So it really does depend on your awake times, but just follow the awake times. It really is a very good tip from today. That's what, what I would suggest. All right, what about the sensory sleep secrets? Okay, so um, just a little bit of information, more information about sleep. You're gonna find it up here in this top widget over here. And when you click on it, you'll find your baby's sleep routine. You'll also find some tips. You can also buy the Sleep Sense chapters and those tips sit behind here. So um, on, on your widgets under day sleep and night sleep, if you click on there, you'll get a very specific um, tip that is pertinent to that exact age and stage. So a couple of things just regards to um, uh, sensory secret. The first thing is to please prevent overstimulation with your babies. If babies are overstimulated, they're gonna be tricky to get to sleep. And the one sure way to get a baby overstimulated is by keeping them awake for too long. So they need to have those regular sleeps um, through the day. That's why the awake times are so important. If you miss a sleep or if you overshoot a sleep, 
your baby will become overstimulated. And when you're overstimulated, you're much more, much more difficult to actually get to sleep. So please do make sure that you prevent overstimulation. And, you know, a lot of mums will ask me, particularly in the early days, like the baby's under three months of age, how much is enough? How do I know if my baby's overstimulated? If your baby's irritable and fussy, and often they look like they're colicky, maybe too much is going on. So in the case of a baby under 12 weeks, actually less is more. All right, the next thing around sensory secrets is our bedtime routine, which is really full of a lot of sensory cues that helps to help babies to know that it's time for sleep. So some of our sensory cues there, um, one is bath time, um, giving your baby a bath about an hour before bedtime. And you'll know from on the app that when you go down to the routine, it'll tell you what time you need to start bath time. And bath time should be approximately an hour before bedtime. Um, you can have smells in the bath like lavender, you can have a lovely diffuser in the room that's very soothing, um, a baby massage, and you can either use just a plain aqueous cream or a, um, a natural vegetable oil. Lots of traction or pulling of the limbs um, is really good as massage. If you don't know formal massage strokes, then um, you can do that. If you are looking for massage strokes, there's one about every four weeks in your activity plan that comes up on the app under play. So watch out for those. Um, make the room dark because we know that darkness or the absence of light releases melatonin in the brain, which is our sleepy hormone. Put on your white noise and your lullabies. And when you're putting in place this lovely bedtime routine, it really does help your baby. And then in your sleep zone, you'll have certain little tools. Like for instance, if your baby's under 12 weeks of age, please swaddle them. That deep pressure of swaddling definitely helps babies um, stay asleep for longer. It inhibits what's called the hypnagogic startle, which is that little startle reflex that wakes babies. So please um, swaddle your baby if they're under 12 weeks. White noise, which is a sound of kind of the ocean or of um, rain. Um, they're lovely white noise apps. That's definitely worth, um, worth, worth using, that white noise. And then obviously a, a nightlight for toddlers over 18 months. So I don't believe in nightlights for little babies because they don't have imaginations, they don't have fears. Um, it's very, it can actually be more disturbing than it can be beneficial. So nightlights only from 18 months onwards. And then please keep an absolutely consistent sleep zone. And um, I mean, this is one of the things for those of you who've got little ones under three months of age, put this in place already. Don't let them fall asleep in front of the TV some nights in their, carry, in, their, in their kind of car seat and other nights in their bed and other nights in your bed. Have it consistent. The more consistent you get it from the earlier, the better it is for them. So it doesn't matter where they sleep. If you want your little one to sleep in your bed, that's fine. If you want them to sleep in their own bedroom, that's also fine. But just make sure that that sleep zone is utterly consistent. And then finally, for sensory sleep secrets, that little doo-doo blankie is very important. Babies need doo-doo blankies to be able to fall asleep. It becomes a sleep association object and something that they can reach for in the middle of the night. Um, so do give them a doo-doo blankie. And then also recognize self-soothing. So sometimes they self-soothe with a doo-doo blankie, but sometimes they'll do things like rubbing their head and getting that bald patch at the back or they might do um, kind of moaning that, mm -hmm. I can remember that my, tod my middle child as a toddler used to moan and I used to get frustrated with her at sleep time and tell her to shush and go to sleep until one day I woke up to the fact that actually she was self-soothing. So vibration and moaning is actually a self-soothing strategy, not crying, I'm talking about moaning. Um, and then often there's wedging where they kind of wedge themselves up against the side of the cot. And that's also a self-soothing strategy. So don't disturb your baby or move them out of that position or any other position that they sleep best in. All right, so um, moving on to self-soothing. Um, this is a bit of a whirlwind tour, but I think I'm giving you all of the little nuggets. You'll be able to take a piece of these and watch out for more tips on these in the app. So the number one um, tip with regards to um, getting a baby to sleep is to teach them to self-soothe. So um, this actually is very important between four and six months of age. So there's been quite a bit of research that has shown that if we get it right between four and six months of age, babies will actually typically be very good sleepers for a long time thereafter. So they'd actually then become um, you know, long-term good sleepers. But if we don't catch it in that four to, four to six month age, you will have to do a little bit more work in the second six months of life. All right, so what are the self-soothing strategies you want to encourage? Either sucking on their hand or using their doo-doo blankie if they're under six months. And if they're over six months, then they can start to use their dummy on their own as well. So you want them to um, be able to self-soothe. Um, this little graph over here shows what happens to your baby through the night. Every 45 minutes, day and night, or whenever your baby is sleeping, they'll come into what's called this REM state, this light sleep state. 
And good sleepers actually just resettle themselves when they're in that state. So for those of you who have got good sleepers, it's because they come into this light sleep state and then they can resettle themselves back into a deep sleep state. Um, you'll remember from when you were pregnant that you started to wake up very regularly over here. And that's because um, you were uncomfortable. So if you're uncomfortable, for instance, you have reflux or eczema, or if you haven't learned to self-soothe, you'll have a sleep disruption here. And that's why for those of you who are having two or three sleep disruptions in the night, this is when they're waking up. So teaching a baby to self-soothe is important. What about managing behaviors? So um, there's no doubt that little ones do develop um, be behaviors. So I'm gonna show you a little video and then I'll come back to this slide. So these are two twins. They are being watched through the baby monitor. So the mom is watching them. So if anybody tells you that babies don't manipulate situations, you can show them this video. Let me talk to him. Hi, babies. <laughs> Do you want to watch that one again? Let me talk to him. Hi, babies. <laughs> So anybody who tells you babies do not manipulate their parents, you can tell them all about this one. All right. So what can we do in terms of boundaries? So little ones do need boundaries. They need to know that it's time for bed. And that's one of the reasons why, and this is for toddlers, not for babies. Okay. So now we've moved on into toddlers. Remember that very early on, we had the basic needs. Then we had the sensory and emotional things um, and routines. And that goes all the way through. But behavior and boundaries comes in the toddler years. So for those of you who are battling in the toddler years, this part's for you. So first of all, don't move your baby out of a cot until they are 24 months old, please. Um, they need to stay in their cot until 24 months because they don't have the boundaries in their mind. They have to use cot boundaries in order to know that that's where they have to stay because they don't have the ability to actually control their behavior. That only comes after two years of age. But it's very important after two years of age, once they're in their own bed, that they, you actually do have bedtime boundaries. Like this is where you sleep and this is how you fall asleep. And having boundaries around sleep is healthy, but very often those boundaries have to be met with a lot of empathy as well. So let's say your toddler um, keeps jumping out of bed. Well, the boundary is they have to stay in bed, um, but you can meet them halfway and sit next to them on, the, on a chair, for instance, until they fall asleep. And often toddlers will go through patches where you're putting in place boundaries, but you're meeting them halfway and doing something alongside them. So stroking their head a little bit or patting them or sitting next to them. And then you start to wean yourself slowly but surely off it. The type of boundaries that you need to put in place for toddlers are what time they go to sleep. Toddlers don't get to rule that part of the, of the household routine and where they sleep, okay? So the times for sleep and where they sleep are very important. Um, often in the middle of the night, you'll find that your toddler comes through. Um, we've all had that happen to us like we've had toddlers. Um, and one of the strategies that I actually use for my kitties and I think is a good strategy is the camp out strategy. So if they come through in the middle of the night, you can say to them, you they need to go back to their room. And then if they're not going back to their room and they keep coming back like 15 times and you're getting exhausted, Putting a little camp mattress under your bed, it can even be as thin as a little, a little mat like that. Um, you put it under your bed and when they come through in the middle of, of the night, you pull it out and they can bank that down next to you. And for those of you who are not wanting to co-sleep, it's quite a nice middle ground. Obviously, if you're wanting to co-sleep, that's probably what they want at that time as well. So then go for it. But if, you, if, your, if your bed is your space, which it was a little bit for me, then pull that camping mattress out, drop your arm over the side of the bed, be there for them emotionally, but have those kind of boundaries around, um, around midnight walkthroughs. Right, so um, as I finish off, I told you that I would try and stick to half an hour and I think I've done a really good job of that. So I can leave lots of lovely time for your questions. Top five things, start with the basics. Health and nutrition needs to be sorted. It needs to be stable. Your baby needs to be gaining weight well and they must be healthy in order to sleep through. And make sure that the solids that you're giving them are really nice and full of those essential fatty acids, that iron, and that protein. Then watch awake times, please. It's the number one thing. If you don't, if you overshoot an awake time, your baby will be overtired and then you will start to use crutches like rocking to sleep, driving around the block to sleep and feeding to sleep, okay? So watch those awake times. They are on the front page of the app. They are probably one of the most important things and they are what drives that routine in the app. 
The third thing is the sensory secrets for sleep. So um, make sure that you and um, that your little one doesn't get overstimulated. Give them the tools to fall asleep, like a doo-doo blankie or a white noise. Um, keep the bed um, rooms completely consistent. So whether they're co-sleeping with you, sleeping in your room or sleeping in their own room, doesn't matter. But what does matter is that it's absolutely consistent and have a good bedtime routine. Tip number three, Make sure your baby learns to self-soothe between four and six months of age. And tip number four, you can manage behavior by um, putting in place boundaries. Right, so that brings us to the end of my um, chat this, this, after, this morning. And I'm now going to go across to your questions and I'm gonna pick up on the questions that I either haven't addressed in my talk, or I'm gonna pick up on the questions that look like they'll be very common to other people. Just before I do, um, I just want to tell you that on Monday, you'll be getting an email from us, which will give anybody who attended this um, webinar a 75% off the lifetime of the app. So if you're on a monthly or on a trial, this is really worth taking up. Um, and then what? if you are on a monthly, you just cancel your monthly and you can take this up with the voucher code that we're going to send to you. So make sure you watch out for that. You'll be purchasing that across from our website. Right, okay, so let us move across to our questions. Let's get that up, all those lovely questions. Okay, so, um, okay, so here's a good question and I know it's a common one, so I'm definitely gonna answer it. Sophie's question, how do I break the feed to sleep cycle? The baby only falls asleep while breastfeeding. So um, if your baby is under 12 weeks of age, as I mentioned, it's not a critical thing. You can just keep going with it. But once your baby's over 12 weeks of age, you do want to separate um, feeds from sleeps for that feed to sleep association. So a couple of little things is, first of all, just start as soon as your baby, they will fall asleep on the breast, take them off and actually rouse them, burp them, make sure their eyes are open and then put them down awake. If your baby is very unsettled when you put them down, leave your hands on them. So give them everything that you would have given if you were giving, if they were having the breastfeed, but just not up against your body. So lots of loving, stroking, patting, holding, containing. And so I really do believe in very, very strong scaffolding to sleep. So, so containing your baby and helping them to fall asleep by holding and touching them, but not up against you. When they're up against you, they're gonna then want that breastfeed again. And this does take time, doesn't happen overnight. Um, but that certainly is a way that you would then break the feed to sleep. Um, okay, let's see the next one. Um, I'm going to move through some of them that I know that I've addressed. So if I don't answer your question, it's because I've probably done it before in this talk. Um, okay, um, sorry, I'm just finding... Um, Okay, so let's have a look at this one. Um, Roche, baby's eight and a half months old, naps are good, um, has a good bedtime routine, goes to sleep well and wakes every two hours at night and needs to be breastfeed to go back to sleep. So just a couple of three little tips. Okay, one is that at nine months old, so you're approaching it now, Roche, nine months old, your baby is going to change their day sleep patterns. So um, you will go from three sleeps down to two sleeps. And again, the apple guide you of exactly which sleep to drop and when to drop it. Um, so that's the first thing. If you're having too many sleeps at nine months, it can in interfere with that nighttime sleep and make them wake up too early at night. Number two, eight and a half month old could very well be dealing with separation anxiety. So that's a very classic time for it to raise its ugly head. And when that happens, your little one will um, kind of call you through in the middle of the night every time they wake up because they want to make sure that you're still alive and you still exist. And so dealing with that through um, separation games in the day, like peekaboo and hide and seek and all of that type of thing is a good strategy. Um, then, of course, at eight and a half months, you and, and then also in the middle of the night, just just calling to them using their voice rather than actually going and do the, doing the breastfeed. So lay your hands on them, stroke them, pat them, but not actually breastfeeding. That'll take care of the separation part without doing the breastfeeding. <laughs> and the third thing is obviously nutrition, because if they're waking every two hours a night, you wonder about nutrition. And so for nutrition, it's um, making sure that they're having lots of super protein at this age. So follow the diet in the, in the Parent Sense app or in the Weaning Sense book. Um, and lots of protein and iron is important at that age. And maybe even an iron supplement to share. And then finally, of course, the biggest thing with a breastfed back to sleep is that you need to break the habit. And the only way to do that is to stop offering it. And so it might be a few nights of daddy putting her to sleep um, because um, it, it can be that your little one does um, is associating you with breastfeeds. 
Okay, another nice, nice question here. For premature babies, do you use their actual or adjusted age for sleeping, especially very premature babies? So you can use their adjusted age um, for, for sleep routines. So, you know, kind of watching their wake times according to their adjusted age. If you've got the app and you put in your baby's prematurity age, it, it will actually give you the adjusted awake times for their, according to their adjusted age. Um, okay. All right, Helena, um, she's got a 21 month old that wakes up screaming in the middle of the night. So, um, and she also has a six month old who's screaming blue murder at bedtime. So you, you've, you've got your hands full, Helena, I can hear. But for that 21 month old who wakes up screaming in the middle of the night. So there are a couple of things that happen in the toddler years. The one is um, nightmares and the other one potentially is night terrors. So what is the difference? Because both of those would result in this waking up and screaming in the middle of the night. A nightmare is an imagination related event. So they've kind of seen something scary. And when you go in, they might be pointing, they might feel very fearful, they're awake, and that's a nightmare. And in a night terror, they're still fast asleep and are just screaming. So they, ha they handle differently. A night terror, you handle by watching their awake times during the day. So 21 month old, she might be starting to drop her day sleep occasionally. If they get overtired, they're often more likely then to actually have those, um, th those night terrors. Um, and likewise, I mean, it, it, in terms of the um, um, in terms of the nightmares, what you want to do is you want to watch what television your little one's watching. Maybe limit television altogether in the late part of the afternoon, and then have a nightlight on for your little one. Right. Um, all right. Let's see. So. Um, Okay, so here's one, um, Laureen, uh, my little boy is one year, three weeks old. He is co-sleeping, but wakes up, feels like every hour of the night. I'm still breastfeeding, only takes three sips when he wakes up, please advise what I can do to um, help him sleep better. So the reality is, Laureen and I am absolutely neutral when it comes to co-sleeping. There's nothing wrong with doing it, but for as long as he's in the bed with you, he's got into the habit now of just reaching for your breast every time he kind of stirs. And that's why, and that's pretty much as he comes into that light sleep stage. Remember that graph I showed you. So I would say that the only way that you're really going to remove the association is removing him from your bed and having him sleep in his own room. And I don't always recommend that, but certainly in this case I do. So I don't know if any of you have ever tried to break a really hard habit like um, coffee or smoking or, or um, alcohol. Whenever you're in the association moment, that's when you actually want it. So, you know, kind of if, if for, for smokers will say that they only ever feel like a cigarette when they um, have, have a cup of coffee, let's say. That's when, it, when it's been typically when they had it. And that's because there's the association. And it's exactly the same for him. He's in an association. He, he thinks that, you know, every time he comes into the light sleep state, he can reach for you. So you're going to need to move him out of your bed. Um, and then assist him when he does wake up in the middle of the night, give him some water rather than a milk feed. Um, okay, this is a great question because it's a common one. Uh, my son's four months old and only naps for 20 minutes. How do I get him to sleep longer? I think you mean not earlier. So that 20 minute cat nap is, um, and let's talk about lengths of sleep. First of all, um, an absolutely typical sleep cycle is 45 minutes. So for those of you who have got a little one who's never sleeping longer than 45 minutes in the day, this is for day sleeps, okay? Um, that's quite typical and it usually only stretches out at six months of age. So your typical day sleep will be um, when they're born, very long stretches of sleep. So like three, four hours and you think, oh, they're just such good sleepers. Then they start to be more wakeful by six weeks and then they go into these 45 minute sleep cycles. So they wake up every 45 minutes and they're awake and then you must just watch the awake times and put them back down again. You can try and make them stretch it longer, but very often they won't, they're awake. At six months of age, as soon as they're on full solids at lunchtime with protein, give them a little bit of a milk feed after that lunch as well, like a little, little bit of a milk snack. That will then help them link those two sleep cycles for that first afternoon sleep. And then they'll often start to have an hour and a half or a longer sleep there. So that's the one piece of, of lengths. This particular mom or, or dad is asking about 20 minute sleeps. And that's slightly different because with uh, 20 minute sleeps, they're very short increments and your baby's actually waking when they have that hypnagogic startle. So that little startle reflex that kind of wakes them up. 
is what's causing the problems there. So at four months old, I know you can't swaddle anymore, but you could try a weighted blanket. A small weighted blanket, which is at about 10% of your baby's body weight, or about this big. Um, and for that, you can actually just put that on your baby and that'll often help them to sleep a little deeper. The other thing that really helps for that is at that age is a white noise. If, if for those of you who are listening and have got cat naps and your baby is younger than four months, then swaddling is the solution. Okay. Um, okay, there we go. Here's one. So from Charlene, how do I handle night wakings at four and a half months? Must I feed every time? Only way she'll fall asleep again. Okay, so at four and a half months, you should be having one nice long stretch of about six hours. So that normally would take you from six in the evening till 12 or from seven until one. And then yes, you would just feed every time they work thereafter, which is usually every three hours thereafter. So at four and a half months, you could be having a one, three, six um, kind of feed. One, one a.m., um, 12, 4 a.m. and 7 a.m., that type of thing. So, you know, kind of three hourly. Um, but if they're waking before 12 a lot or a lot, like let's say your four and a half month old is waking every hour or is waking at um, 10, 12, 2 and all of those, then you wouldn't necessarily be offering milk every time. Then what I would be doing is I would be offering water before 12, as long as they're gaining weight, as long as your little four and a half month old is gaining weight, you can offer water before uh, midnight. Um, but for little babies, obviously you are going to respond with a feed. Um, All right, so Darren, she says, my seven month old has been a good sleeper from the beginning until two weeks ago. Okay, so if you've had a good sleeper from the beginning, you can get it back, don't worry. Um, he's gone from sleeping through to waking, often to need a cuddle, sometimes an extra feed. He's been in the red zone on the Wonder Weeks app. So the Wonder Weeks app, um, the, those um, leaps, please don't hang your hat on them because what actually often ends up happening is that moms start to expect something because that's what the app is saying is coming. And in actual fact, you know, it's a, it's a little bit like a horoscope where if you're told that you're going to be, um, you know, kind of meeting somebody in a, you know, in, in a workspace, you'll be going to a workspace. And of course, you're going to meet somebody there. So um, the point is, don't don't hang your hat on that. What's more likely to happen for your seven month old is that they're going through a little bit of a um, separation anxiety stage. Um, and so for that, use the um, activities like hide and seek, peekaboo, all of those type of little um, games will be much and um, what will help your little one start to know that you still exist when they can't see you so that's the first thing second thing at seven months old is definitely increase the protein make sure they're having lots of protein every single meal so at least a tablespoon breakfast lunch and supper um, and then obviously if you haven't introduced solids proper three meals of solids you do need to do that okay um Okay, this is a very good question. Um, can giving red meat for dinner cause restless sleep at night? My baby's been turning on her tummy more during the last two nights, um, but is also used to all the food groups and eats really well. She's just over one. So, you know, some people do react to more the heavier foods in the evening and then do, do become a little bit more restless. So what I would do is I would limit red meat um, to lunchtime for a couple of days, see if that helps. And so in the evenings have fish and chicken rather, or eggs, um, and then go back to, and then kind of do an A-B test. Um, all right, so we've got 15 minutes left. Um, anybody who is mentioning the app in their questions, I definitely will preference those questions now because I do want to hear how you're feeling about the app. Um, and um, so please do pop up some comments about the app as well. This is a great question. Carly, I am delighted you've asked this question. Um, in the UK, the recommendation is to only start solids at six months. Why is the difference versus the South African guidance? So um, there is a lot of controversy around this. So a few years ago, um, going back about 20 years or more, um, there was a belief that introducing solids under six months of age could cause allergies. And so we were recommended to introduce solids after six months and proteins even later. And shortly thereafter, in the last kind of 10 or 15 years, uh, research started to be done around the increase of allergies. And we started to find that babies who had aller allergens introduced later had a higher chance of allergies, not a lower chance of allergies. So children, for instance, in Southeast Asia and countries that are very exposed to peanuts, as an example, have low peanut allergy incidence, where children in Australia, as an example, who have very late introduction of solids, plus um, you know, late introduction of, of proteins, have an increased chance of, of um, allergies. And so we started to research maybe bringing um, solids back a little bit earlier. 
the research now shows us, and it's very, very clear. And if you're not, if you do want more information, please get the Weaning Sense book. Carly, it is available in the UK, so it's uh, you can just go and get it on Amazon. And there's a whole chapter on this and the science of it. Um, what we now understand is that introduction of solids between four and six months of age is not only healthy for a baby's gut, they can cope with it fine, but also may prevent picky eating and allergies. However, the World Health Organization still says exclusive breastfeeding, not bottle feeding, breastfeeding until six months of age. So that is where the confusion comes. So when the health, World Health Organization says that, the reason that they're saying that is that in developing countries, which is who is in, which is really the type of countries that they are trying to have their impact on, the World Health, World health Organization, introducing solids or bottles, formula bottles under six months of age is dangerous for the baby's health because of clean water systems and access to good healthy food. And so the World Health Organization has kept their criteria as six months, but we do know that if you are in the Western world, if you have got access to good, healthy, um, clean water and healthy food, introducing solids between four and six months of age is absolutely fine. Um, all right, let's see, uh, quite a few uh, uh, repeat questions. Um, okay, here's a good one, COBA, because this is another question that a lot of people will ask. The dummy dilemma. So um, my six month old wakes up every hour during the night for me to replace his dummy, how do I change it? So dummy patrol is a pain. And to be honest with you, Cobra, it can only really start to be addressed at seven months. So you've got another month of it. And the reason is that at six months, babies don't have the skills to be able to put in their dummies. But what you can already start doing is putting the dummy into his hand um, it, during the day so that he can learn to put it in himself and then start to really teach him actively how to actually put it in himself. Um, and, um, and that will help you. All right, okay, so as I mentioned, I'm gonna preference those questions that do mention the app now so that we can get a bit of feedback from other people. Um, okay, so here's a good question from Angela about the app. She says, I love the app, thank you, Meg. When will I be able to share it with my husband under the same full subscription? Angela, this has been such a bugbear for us because we've been waiting to do that for months now. We have got other little bugs in the app that we have to rule out first, but I can promise you that we will be working on it. And I think it's the next big piece of functionality that is going to be developed. So probably within the next month, you should be able to have that. All right. Um, okay, let's see. Um, okay, I'm going to go across to the chat because I can see that there's a lot of questions on the chat, 82 questions on the chat. So let's have a look and see how many I can do in the next 10 minutes. Um, all right, okay. Um, all right, oh, Sarah, I love your question. Okay, so this is a big one, guys. She says, and I'm very excited about this. I'm gonna screenshot this question. She says, the app is great and I'm really enjoying it. The only thing I would like to see is data analysis. We are putting so much detail, so much data into the application, it would be great to see the analysis on it such as typical feed times typical waking times and some relevant advice for this data i love your question because we employed our first data scientist this month he started literally at the beginning of may and we currently are working on an email that will be coming out to you once a week telling you your baby's averages what's going on so we're busy working on it at the moment and sarah and i would love because this is something that is close to your heart i would love it if you would email us afterwards you can respond to the email that this link came on and if you would like to be part of a work group who wants to tell us what you want to hear about your baby weekly, we would absolutely love it. So please do um, come on board and let us know. Um, all right, let's see if we've got some other questions. Um, okay, so this is a great question. Um, another one I'm from Angela, different Angela. She says, I'm struggling to get my 13 month olds to have two naps in the day. Um, and she generally wakes up at seven, we put her to sleep at six and a nap at 11 a.m. She's waking um, frequently at night and I'm wondering if she's overtired, any suggestions? So Angela, at 12 to 14 months, so your baby slap bang in the middle of that, um, little ones drop their two sleeps down to their one sleep. So those are called cusp ages. For those of you who follow the app, you will know when your baby's hitting a cusp age. And at that cusp age, um, your baby will then start to drop from two sleeps to one sleep. So what you're doing with a nap at 11 and then down at six is spot on. That is not the reason that your baby is waking up frequently at night. There will be other reasons for it. And it won't be that because you are giving her the right sleeps. That um, 11 a.m. sleep, you can move it slightly closer to 12. The app will guide you to do that. And then they'll usually sleep from 12 until half past one, an hour and a half. 
and that's more than enough sleep for your 13 month old and then they will sleep those 12 hours at night um, um, from uh, six to seven. Um, if she's waking up frequently at night, it's more likely to be something like, is she having enough protein? Is she having enough iron in her diet? Um, are her, um, is her bedtime routine calming? Um, so have a look at all of those type of things. Okay, uh, related to that is Bianca's question, which is a great question. Um, how do I suggest transitioning from two sleeps to one sleep? Okay, so this goes, um, these cusp ages, the one happens at nine months when you go from three sleeps to two sleeps. And the other one happens at 12 to 14 months when, when you go from two sleeps to one sleep. And another one happens between two and five years old when you go from one sleep to no sleeps. So a couple of tips here. The first one is that you can actually on the days that you're, so for, first of all, to know that your baby's ready for this, they either fight bedtime or they wake up frequently at night or they actually fight at each sleep. So each sleep they, is a battle to put them down. When that happens, move the first sleep later so for instance, in your case, Bianca, if you're going from two sleeps to one sleep, she's probably having like a 9 or 10 a.m. sleep and then a kind of a 2 or 3 p.m. sleep or 1 or 2 um, sleep and you're going to bring it back to the middle. So what you're going to do is you're going to drop that 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, okay? And she's going to be dog tired by 10.30. And so at 11 o'clock, you'll put her down and then she will have, a, have her sleep. And I recommend giving a nice hearty lunch just before. So an 11 o'clock lunch and then into bed you know, for, for her sleep. So she has a good long sleep. And then in the late afternoon, she might be absolutely completely finished by half past five and you can bring, bring bedtime forward to 6 p.m. So bring it a little bit earlier. The next day, give her two sleeps. And then the next day, one sleep. So you start to alternate it out and follow her cues. And within a couple of days, within a week, she normally will be down to her one sleep. And then once she's down to one sleep, you can move it slightly later. Great, okay. Um, all right, so, okay, so this is, um, from, and this is a very common one from Casey. She says, my five month old won't fall asleep um, unless I rock her to sleep. If I put her down drowsy and awake, she gets more and more irritated, escalates into screaming until I pick her up. Any tips to get her to fall asleep on her own? So she is in this classic stage. Remember I said tip number one was get your baby to self-soothe between five and between four and seven months. And that's the critical age. So she's slap bang in the middle of that. So I would just be really persisting. So give her a, lot, a big cuddle, get her drowsy, put her down, stay with her. Do all that support with her lying down, pat, pat, stroke, stroke. If she becomes absolutely hysterical, pick her up, give her a love. When she's drowsy, back down again. And if you start to do that, that kind of putting her down regularly, like, like repeatedly, she'll eventually move with it. And so it's a more gentle way of kind of sleep training, as it were, than if you don't, um, than, than if, you know, if, if you just put her down and kind of walk out the room, which I don't love. Um, okay, so um, here's one from Louise. Is it normal for a two and a half year old to completely drop their daytime sleep? Highly variable, Louise. Um, in fact, some little ones will actually hold on to their day sleep until they are um, five years old. My middle child did that. And then my first and my third child, they drop them as early as two and a half years old. And the very important principle here is they must have a daytime rest. So they don't have to have a daytime sleep, they have to have a daytime rest. Okay. Um, okay, so there is um, the next, another nice question about the app. So as I said, I'm preferencing all the app questions. Is it possible to show the exact awake time on the app that the baby has been awake? I like to use it as a guideline for the next sleep. Oh my goodness, I love that idea for functionality. You see, this is how we get our, all our lovely ideas. So to have something that's actually counting down for when you're hitting the end of the awake time, I think it's a great idea and I think it's something we should add in. So leave that one with us, I think it's super. Um, all right. Okay, so here's another very typical one of a a uh, four-week-old, so Nicole, she says, my four-week-old stays awake at night, sometimes for an hour after feed. Um, this is after we only, this is after we only change nappy and feed in the dark. Is it related to daytime naps or other issues? So four weeks old, still very, very little. And so potentially it's just that um, your little one needs to kind of have a little bit of a defrag time. I would be using swaddling. So feed in the dark, don't change the nappy unless it's actually got a poo in it, which at four weeks it might still have the poo. Your little one will be reaching the age where they won't poo in their nappies at night anymore. Um, but it's not related to daytime naps, Nicole. It's just the way the newborns are. So deep swaddling and white noise um, will help with that. All right, only two more questions. Um, okay, so Bianca says the, um, 
F says I can start weaning the dummy now. How do I wean off the dummy 14 month olds? So yeah, so look, the dummy is an interesting one. And this is a great question, which is why I'm answering it because um, you don't have to wean your baby off a dummy at any specific age. In actual fact, you know, for some babies, they might still want their dummy and be sleeping well with it at like three years old. And that's nothing major. However, from about this age of 14 months, stop offering the dummy when your baby's awake ever. So limit the dummy only to the, to the cot. So you can tie it to the cot, you can have it connected to the cot. Um, and when you do that, um, they start to only associate the dummy with sleep times. They can use it independently and it doesn't hamper their language. So the big thing with apps is we don't want it to, and with dummies is we don't want it to hamper their, their language. So having it in their mouth during awake times is not something that we recommend. So, and that's an easy way for them to um, be able to, um, to to be able to break the dummy habit later on because it's only for sleep times. It's not there all the time. All right, um, Beth says, hi Meg, I use white noise and it's amazing. But we had a discussion in my mum's group regarding when we can or should stop the white noise so they don't become dependent on it. At what age do they go out of needing sleep support tools like dummies, blankies, white noise? What a great question, Beth. So, um, first of all, I like white noise and dummies and, and duty blankies because they can be used independently. So, as long as something can be used independently, it's not really a crutch you need to worry about. It's a crutch your baby will grow out of and it's a crutch that will disappear at an age where your baby can actually be sleeping better anyway. So, I am hugely in favor of sleep. So, if your baby's using something as a crutch, go with it. That's my piece of advice. Um, I don't think you need to worry about them being dependent on it. They just do outgrow it. Um, later on, when they are toddlers, you'll find that getting rid of the dummy blankie and white noise just happens. So I wouldn't worry about habits. Okay, so um, okay, so this is also a good question. Uh, my second last question, Trisha, she says, hello, my 12 month old gets up and stands in her cot at bedtime and falls over a lot because she's tired. Any tips to get her to lie down more when she's drowsy? Um, and also she falls over because she's in a sleep sack. Very common. So my recommendation is not to lay your baby down um, at the stage there because you'll get into a battle where you lay her down, she stands up, you lay her down, she stands up. And that causes more problems and more disruption. So I would actually leave her standing. She will kind of topple over, but it won't be long before she stops trying that, that kind of strategy and she'll just maybe stand up, sit herself down and go off to sleep. So don't get into that battle of making a baby who's sitting or standing lie down because it really is very disruptive. Okay, um, very last question. Um, okay, nice one, Terry, because this is a question that's very common for everybody. And that is, I've got a two and a half month old, he sleeps in a crib next to our bed. At what stage do we move into his, his own room? You can move a baby to their own room at any, any age at all. Don't, you know, it, it can be as early as two weeks and as late as two years old. The easier age is before four months. And the reason that it's before four months is that babies don't have long-term memory and kind of connecting kind of a long-term sleep association a lot before four months. So if you want to just do it easily, he doesn't, won't even notice it, move him before four months. But if you want him next to your bed, absolutely fine. Um, have him next to your bed for as long as you want. So I know I didn't get to even a fraction of the questions. I knew I wouldn't, and I'm really sorry about that. We just had so many people on today. Thank you all for joining me. Thank you for using the app. Please do give us feedback. If it's constructive feedback that we need to change something that you're not loving, please email it to us. If you're loving the app, I ask that you please go and um, pop it onto the, onto the app stores. It really does help other people know whether or not to get the app and what's useful about it. Um, so please do go and review our app. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for the support and, um, and thank you that I'm able to be part of your journey. Um, good luck with the sleep and we'll see you next time. Thank you.